Thank you. You may be seated. Trust and obey. That's faith and works. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to the book of Acts. We're Acts chapter 20. We're looking at the final part of the farewell to Ephesus. An emotional time for the Apostle Paul, an emotional time for the elders, an emotional time for their families because they came with their families to meet him there at the shore before he would depart, never to see them again. Of course, you'll see them in heaven. He has seen them in heaven. Someday we'll see them in heaven too, but human partings and human farewells are always filled with sorrow and tears. Whether it's for a short period of time with someone whom we truly love, or for an extended period as loved ones depart and go to heaven. In some cases, loved ones who do not know Christ, whom we'll never see again in the same way that we've seen them here. Paul is saying farewell to the Ephesian elders. Beginning in verse 13. And we went before to ship and sailed unto Assos, there intending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, binding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came over to Mytilene and sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Tregilium, and the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. Interesting, a place where he had been for three years. Longest period of time in his ministry. And he was going to sail by and not even stop in and say hi. Because he had a divine mandate. Oftentimes we wonder why it is in the plan of God that he causes us to sail on by. There's something more important on his agenda. Places that we'd like to go, places that we'd like to spend time, places where we know there are Christians with whom we can have fellowship, places where there is great doctrinal encouragement and a great deal of opportunity. And yet sometimes in the course of life, we have to sail on by. For he hasted, if it were possible, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to the Ephesus and called the elders of the church. It's interesting, he did not call for a general church meeting. He called only for the leadership. I'm sure there were dozens, perhaps even Hundreds of people at Ephesus who would have loved to see the Apostle Paul, loved to hear him preach just one more time. But he called for the elders. There have been great men of God, some here at this church, who drew great crowds and thousands of people would like to hear them preach. I think every one of us, every Christian in church history would have loved to hear the Apostle Paul preach. The Ephesians had gotten to hear him preach, but he only called for the elders, for a select group. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ, though he spoke to many thousands of people, there were times reserved only for the disciples, because it was to them that he had entrusted the carrying of the message into the next generation. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. The principal leader was open and available to those who were in secondary roles of leadership who are now moving into the primary positions of leadership at Ephesus. Paul had not hidden from them his lifestyle. 
he had not preached one thing while living covertly behind a mask. They knew everything about him. They knew how they were supposed to live because he was their model and their under pattern. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. It's interesting that the first thing that he mentions here in terms of the example that he sets is his humility. There was no pride, though Paul could have been proud. There was no boasting, though Paul could have boasted. The first thing that he reminds them of as leaders, as leaders, is humility. And with many tears and temptations. Leaders should weep for and pray for their people. Leaders should weep for and pray for those who are lost. This afternoon I was reading a book written by a Jewish rabbi and entitled Hard Questions That Jews Ask. And I turned to the chapter that was dealing with what about the Messiah? And I wept as I read that chapter. And I prayed for that rabbi's salvation. He knows precisely what Christians believe and what they teach. He knows exactly what happened to Jesus on Calvary's cross. And he knows about the resurrection and he explains it in that chapter. This is what Christians believe and why we as Jews do not. We're not the same as the Christians. We believe many of the same things, but the Christians believe that Jesus paid for their sins and they are forgiven. And we believe that we must do good works so that we can get right with God. We can make things right with God. He goes through the entire gospel in that chapter and clearly articulates what we believe, but says, but we as Jews believe that we can make it right with God ourselves. And as I read it, I wept. For a man who has a head knowledge, but does not know that Jesus is his Messiah, and that he died so that that man's sins might be forgiven. Do you weep for people who are lost? I hope you do. To those of you who are here who are elders, do you weep for this congregation? I do, I hope you do. Paul says that he had wept over the Ephesians with many tears. He was willing to face the pressures because he says, and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. He's not being speaking about being tempted to commit various sins. He's talking about the testings that came on him constantly by people trying to assassinate him. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you. I have modeled for you profitable things. When you do these things, said Paul, there is profit in them. There are many things that each one of us spend time in each day that are not profitable. You're faced with a new week. Throughout this week, you're going to make decisions. You're going to make choices about what to do with your time. Now, those of you who are employed know that certain choices have already been made for you and you must fulfill your obligation because you are under authority in the context of your job. 
you know that you must do those things in a way that is honorable to Christ. That you don't cheat, you don't steal, you don't lie. You don't shortchange your boss by wasting time. But there are 168 hours in this coming week. And if you work 40 hours, you have 128 hours that are left that you have to make a decision concerning how you will use those hours. Some hours will be in sleep, but some of that sleep may be sloth. Paul showed them what was profitable by the things that he did. Some of your week will perhaps be spent in entertainment. Is it profitable? We're going to be getting to that in just a second. We have 12 different tests that are given to us that are referenced in one of Paul's epistles. And he's going to speak of those tests here in Acts, and we're going to see where he develops them over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Is it profitable? Are you being a profitable steward of your time? Are you being a profitable steward of your energy? Are you being a profitable steward of your resources? Paul didn't just tell them about it, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but have showed you. He demonstrated as well as teaching. Teaching was second, demonstration was first, and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Publicly, someone might say, well, we didn't quite get it, but Paul went and personally shared with them those things that were profitable. Elders are supposed to be doing that, showing what is profitable, teaching what is profitable, making sure it is done even in the context of the home, testifying both to Jews and also to the Greeks. Paul was open in his public testimony. And then we talked about the five things that he makes as the majors upon which we should major, not leaving anything out, but certainly focusing on these things. Repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we get down a little bit further and we'll pick up the rest of those things where he speaks about the return of Christ. But he says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem he knew what God wanted him to do, and he was willing to pass by Ephesus, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Grace characterized Paul's ministry. I'm afraid that many times we're so focused on law that we forget grace. Grace is extended to us as we are guilty. Mercy is extended to us as we are miserable. It's easy to remember. G and G, M and M. Grace, guilty. Mercy, misery. God extends his grace to us as we are guilty, as we are sinners. But mercy is extended to us when we are experiencing the consequences of our sin. Because sin always brings misery. And so he extends to us his mercy as we go through the misery of the consequences of sin. 
And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. So there's number four. The grace of God, now the kingdom of God. Shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. There are majors, but that does not mean we leave out the other things. Some churches preach only a handful of doctrines that their people are comfortable with and never get into anything that might be offensive, anything that might make someone angry. But Paul said, I preach to you the whole counsel of God. And then some very important advice for elders. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. We can be so careful about taking care of other things and other people that we forget that we ourselves are role models. Take heed to yourselves. The elders are to be role models for the entire congregation. Take heed to yourselves. That is stated before and to all the flock. Oh, and it's important to take care of the flock also. Elders are to be involved in all the pastoral ministries of the flock. Many times we think of the elders as those guys who meet once a month for session meetings. But that's not the picture that's given of the elders in the New Testament. We'll be seeing more of that in just a few moments. They're actually supposed to be caring for the flock. Feeding the flock, guiding the flock, protecting the flock, disciplining the flock. Helping bring new life as the ewes give birth to the lambs. They are functioning not with their own flock, but with God's flock. Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. That's a rather striking statement. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd, but the Holy Ghost is the one who appoints the under-shepherds. Because you see, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives the spiritual gifts. The Lord Jesus Christ and the Father both sent the Spirit, and of course he is in harmony with them, but it is the Spirit of God who gives the spiritual gifts, including the leadership gifts. The gift of evangelist, the gift of pastor-teacher, the gift of teacher. It is the Holy Ghost who has made you overseers. That's the word for bishops. Those who are elders among us, it is the Holy Spirit who has put you with that responsibility. And then he says, to feed the church of God. Are you involved in that? Involved in feeding, spiritual feeding, the church of God? And then, very interesting, because we speak here of the Trinity in this verse, the Holy Spirit, God, and then it says, which he hath purchased with his own blood. It was not the Holy Spirit who shed blood. It was not the Father who shed blood. It was Christ who shed his blood. You have all three members of the Trinity mentioned in verse 28, which he, Jesus Christ, hath purchased with his own blood. He paid for it. Many years ago, there were cattle drives in the West. 
where from all over the country, from California and from Texas and from the north, they would drive the cattle in herds to Kansas City, where the slaughterhouses were located. And there, the herds would be purchased, and they would be killed. But here, we have the shepherd purchasing the flock and paying for it the greatest of all possible prices. The shepherd pays for the flock with his own blood. I can remember San Antonio used to be a great center of slaughterhouses as well, and there were certain areas of the city when you drove through them, they stank from the decaying blood. I was a small child, you don't smell that anymore, they've put all the pollution controls in. But I can remember driving through those areas and wishing that we were out because it smelled so horrid. But here the flock is to live and the shepherd is the one who dies. And that flock for whom the shepherd died has been entrusted to the elders. And the elders will give account to the one who died as to how they have cared for the flock. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Always on the alert for an external attack. Always on the alert for an internal attack. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians of their divisions in the church. We read that this morning as we read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 concerning the Lord's table. And he says, I realize that that will have to be because there are heresies and those things cause divisions. And that shows who the ones who are divisive are. But he warns them of it here. Therefore, watch. One of the principal responsibilities of an elder is to watch. One of the principal responsibilities is always to be on the alert, always to be ready for either an external or an internal attack, either for the enemy from the outside or the quizzling from the inside. Always watching and always remembering. Remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. The second time in the passage that Paul mentions his tears because he knew how dangerous the wolves are and how dangerous those who cause divisions are. Night and day, round the clock, watching and warning. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. It's not the law that builds you up. It's grace that builds you up. The law only condemns you. The law only shows you where you are guilty. The law only shows you where you have failed. The law only points out that you are a sinner. But the grace of God not only saves you, the grace of God builds you up. The grace of God sanctifies you. The grace of God encourages you. The grace of God gives you hope. To the grace of God which is able to build you up, and the grace of God does something else. It gives you an inheritance. I think all of us would love to have some wealthy person who is going to leave to us a hundred million dollars. How many of you would like that? 
I see at least one hand. I think the rest of you are lying. <laughs> oh, I see two hands. Okay. We would all like to have that kind of an inheritance, wouldn't we? Although, remember, when you have much given to you, from you shall much be required. So perhaps it's better that we not have that because I think we would all be tempted to abuse it and not use it for the glory of Christ. To indulge ourselves and the lusts of our flesh rather than finding how as stewards we could use it for Jesus. But the grace of God gives you an inheritance that is worth more than a hundred million dollars. It's infinitely valuable. It lasts not only for time, in which all things corrupt, in which all things will be burned up, but it's an inheritance that lasts for eternity. And it says, among all them that are sanctified. Sanctified doesn't mean that you are sinlessly holy, that you have quit committing crimes against the holy God. It means you've been set apart for his service. And you will receive an inheritance by grace. You don't deserve that inheritance. When we were in law school, we learned about what are called laughing heirs. Those are people who get a letter in the mail one day from a lawyer, and it says, your great uncle Alfonso, second removed from your mother's fourth cousin, has no heirs, and as we have traced it through to try to find out whom to give this money to, it has landed upon you. And you say, I have no idea who Uncle Alfonso was, but I am sure glad. And I laugh all the way to the bank as I take the check. Those are laughing heirs. We don't deserve it. And yet God gives it to us by grace. Paul says, I didn't get it because I coveted it. I didn't get it because I worked for it. I didn't get it because I manipulated it. Because he says, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. No, Paul says, as a matter of fact, the way that I supported myself is I worked outside when the church either could not or would not support me. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Paul was the head of his mission board and he supported his entire mission team. A different concept than we have today, isn't it? I have showed you. Here we go back to the illustration of life. This is the third time that he's mentioned it in the passage. I have showed you all things. I have set the personal example for you, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. Not run over the weak, not shove the weak into a corner, not try to get rid of the weak, not try to have somebody else take the place of the weak, but to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's interesting that that's the last thing that Paul tells them before he kneels down to prayer. He ends with the issue of giving. All of us are wealthy compared to these people back then. All of us are wealthy compared to the majority of the people in the world. We do not find those words of Jesus in the Gospels. But Jesus said them. And Paul quotes them. And the people had heard them before because it says, Remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Back to that illustration of the inheritance. If we were going to receive an inheritance, we would call ourselves blessed. We would be thrilled 
And as the inheritance got larger and larger and larger, and we found out more and more and more of the things that we were going to get, and, you know, we get the letter and we read through the list, and the first thing we're going to get is this big bank account. And then suddenly we realize that the next paragraph talks about a great big mansion off in New York City or wherever. And then we find out that we're going to be getting a diamond mine in South Africa. And then, then we find out that we're going to be getting a, a gold mine someplace. And then we're going to get this entire business. We're going to own Google or something like that. And all the money's going to come to us. We get excited. We think of that as a blessing. God says it's more blessed, Jesus says, to give than to receive. He stood one day, he and his disciples, watching donations come in to the treasury. There was a box out there in the center of the temple courtyard. And people would come up and drop something in. When the wealthy people came to make sure there was room for them to get through, they would sound some trumpets. And everybody would say, uh-oh, a rich guy's coming. And the trumpets would sound and the wealthy guy would walk forward and maybe several people of their servants would be there and sort of genuflecting or nodding to them like this. The wealthy guy would go up and he wouldn't just drop the bag in. He would untie the bag and turn it upside down and hold it high enough so that you could see all the gold coins dropping into the treasury. And everybody would go, wow, I guess the temple's doing okay today. And as they watched, Jesus made no comment until a widow came and dropped in two mites. And that's the illustration that Jesus gave to his disciples. He said, she has given more than all the rest of them because she gave her entire living. She gave all that she had. The rest gave out of their abundance. They still had plenty to live on. But she gave all that she had everything that she had to live on. Who is more blessed? From God's perspective, who is more blessed? The rich guy sounding the trumpet, dumping his money in for the widow who had no one to support her and who had no other source of income and gave the last two mites that she had. It is more blessed to give than to receive. The last thing he says, and when they had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. They all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Let me summarize quickly the lessons that we've learned out of this passage. Number one, for church leaders, Teach everything that is profitable, but major on the majors. The five that are listed are repentance, faith, the gospel, grace, and the kingdom of God. That's the millennial kingdom of Christ. How to live the Christian life in light of the imminent return of Christ. That does not mean you omit other things. Number two, be consistent and transparent. If you're doing it right, don't change your lifestyle or your doctrine. Number three, the lesson that we learned was preach content. Preach the word, realizing that sometimes you receive specific direction where to preach and where not to preach. They were forbidden by the Holy Ghost, you remember, to preach the word in Asia. And Paul tells Timothy the same thing. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who should judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. Lesson number four, preach in light of the imminent return of Christ. In light of the imminent return of Christ. It could happen while this sermon is going on. I hope every one of us would go up and that this building would be empty, but it might not be so. In light of the imminent return of Christ, preaching the kingdom of God to them. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. 
Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Wherefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Lesson number five that we learned. You will be held accountable for not preaching all the counsel of God. This is to elders. Now, that applies to all of us, but specifically to the elders and not just to the pastor. Don't be afraid of offending people. We will be held accountable for not preaching all the counsel of God. It's one of the reasons I preached about hell for the last two messages on Sunday morning. Verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Lesson number six that we learned, the temptation to compromise is great, but don't do it. It is so easy to compromise just to get a little breathing room, just to get people off your back, just to make people turn their anger towards somebody or something else. Paul covers the 12 great temptations that I mentioned a moment ago that face every Christian. Almost every temptation that you will ever face falls into one of these 12 categories. This is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, please turn over there to chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to go through that passage and list for you the 12 different temptations that tempt you to compromise. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The first temptation is a matter of sloth. Verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Failure to know Bible history, failure to know the heroes of faith, failure to know what they did, why they did it, when they did it, in face of what oppositions they stood. That's sloth. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. And he begins to deal with some of the things in the history of Israel. Sloth. Are you ignorant of them? You say, well, I've been in church now for 47 years, and seven months and three days and 22 hours. How much time do you spend in the Word every day? How much time do you spend studying the historical books of the Old Testament? Because twice Paul tells us that those are given as examples for us to know how God deals with people. That means us. Sloth is the first. Number two, faith in fearful times. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now folks, they were living in fearful times. They had Pharaoh and his chariots behind them. On either side they had walls of water several hundred feet high. They were following Moses through the dark They were living in fearful times. The second test that you're going to be faced with is having faith in fearful times. You are living in fearful times. Test number three. Willingness to openly identify with Christ. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. You know, baptism, the meaning of baptism is not salvation. The meaning of baptism is not sanctification. The meaning of baptism is identification. Where you are openly and publicly identifying with Christ. That's the third area of testing and temptation where we often compromise. We do not want to openly and publicly identify with Christ, especially in fearful times, and especially if it means we have to overcome our indolence and sloth. Number four, spiritual growth. 
verse 3, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. The word of God is our spiritual food. It is the word of God and the intake of the word of God that causes growth. You don't get growth by taking the food and rubbing it on your body. You get growth by taking the food and putting it into your mouth and swallowing it. It's not enough to play around with the word. You have to eat it. You have to absorb it. You have to make it part of your being. They all did eat of that same spiritual meat. Are you growing spiritually? That's a test. You've all heard of growing pains. You all know that how, as you went through your teenage years, there were those awkward, gangly years where sometimes it sort of hurt because you were growing in a growth spurt and it didn't feel as comfortable and you felt sort of odd and funny. You felt like you were sort of out of it and you really didn't want anybody to know you were going through it. But it's necessary. Don't compromise just to avoid spiritual growth. Test number five is spiritual fellowship. That's verse four. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. He was always there, always available, always a source of their refreshment, always a source of their encouragement, always available, where we can have fellowship with him. And because we have fellowship with him, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Test number six, responding to spiritual discipline for disobedience. And he summarizes it for us in verse five. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And if you go through the wilderness experiences, you find at least eight different specific things. Disobedience, anger, gluttony, sloth, pride, lust, envy, and greed. Seven of those are the seven deadly sins. And you find illustrations of all of them. And he summarizes it in verse five. They didn't respond properly to spiritual discipline. With many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. That's a test that we have to go through. How do we respond to spiritual discipline? Do we say, yes, sir? Do we get back in line? Do we obey? Test number seven, the lusts of the flesh. Now, these things were our examples, the first of two times that he tells us that, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And that, of course, included gluttony, because you remember they lusted after the flesh of the birds. And God said, OK, I'll send you birds, sent them plenty of quail. And they were so excited, they sunk their teeth into those things. And while it was still in their mouth, God killed a bunch of them. Test number eight, and here's a big one. The test is idolatry. Verse seven, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. Say, well, hey, I look around our church, man, we don't have any decorations at all. Well, we don't, we don't have any idols. We don't have any statues of Mary. We don't have any statues of the saints. We don't have any statues of Buddha. We don't have any statues of Kali or any of these other Hindu pagan gods and all those other zillions of gods that are out there. No, but do you have any gods in your heart? Colossians 3.5 and, Coloss and Ephesians 5.5 5 tell us that covetousness is idolatry. It tells us that the covetous man is an idolater. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. That is a very important test here in the United States. That's a test that causes many Christians to fall and test number nine. Oh my, here is one that certainly affects many American Christians. Test number nine is entertainment. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Heard some of you guys talking about the sports game this afternoon. I don't even know what sport it is. <laughs> what season of the year, I suppose it's football. But were the Phillies going to be at home or were they going to be away? Phillies. Is that football? I don't know. 
I don't follow any sports. Sports and hobbies can become idolatry too. It's a test. Where do we set our affections? Colossians chapter 3. Set your affections on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Wherefore, mortify, that means put to death your members which are upon earth. Test number nine is entertainment. Test number ten, here's a big one in America. Test number ten is sex. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. In one day! You can hardly walk through the grocery uh, store checkout line without seeing what 25 years ago would have been considered pornographic with all these magazines that have all these half-naked celebrities on the front of them talking about their immoral affairs and how they're planning to have a baby and so they decided that they ought to get married too. Your people, that's the culture we live in. That's a test that you as a Christian are being faced with every day. Test number 11 is rebellion. Verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Tempting means to put to the test. They rebelled against him ten times. And God finally said, that's enough. You will die. Rebellion. We're faced with that test every day when we know what God's word wants us to do and we decide to do something else instead. Test number 12, complaining. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Griping, mumbling, belly aching, grousing around behind the back of the pastor and the elders, wishing the things were different and telling everybody else that's the way you feel about it. It's test number 12, that's a hard one. Because all of us have things that we'd like to complain about. And then it gives us three applications here in this passage. Verse 11. The first is example. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Did you realize that everything in the Old Testament was written for your benefit? That's where we go back to the issue of sloth. Test number one was to know I would not have you be ignorant, brethren. To know what's in the Old Testament. To know who the people are. Do you know who Amram is? Do you know who Yochavit is? How many of you, raise your hand if you know who Amram and Yochavit are? One person, two persons. They happen to be two very incredibly important people they're the parents of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Do you know what is the theme of Zephaniah? How about the theme of Zechariah? How about the theme of any of the minor prophets? If I asked you how many chapters were in the book of Daniel, could you tell me? That's a very popular and important book. How about in Isaiah? Do you know the theme of each of the chapters? Do you know that you should not be ignorant? Because those things were written for you upon whom the ends of the world are come. 
it gets back to that issue of sloth. The first test that we're put to is the test of sloth. Example is number one of the application. Application number two is warning. Verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We think we're doing so well. We're American Christians. We've got Christian radio. We've got Christian TV, if you can call it that. We've got Christian internet. We've got Christian books. We've got concordances. And we've got commentaries. And well, we've got all kinds of study helps and we can get it on our iPad and we can have multiple translations showing up at the same time on our computer screen and we can compare them and we can find out from Strong's exhaustive concordance what the Greek word means here, and what the Hebrew word means there, and how those interrelate between each other, Old Testament to New Testament. We have cross-reference Bibles. We have topical study Bibles. We have Bibles with extensive footnotes. We think we're standing. But here's the issue of pride. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And then finally, the third application. The third application is a guarantee of five things. The third application is a guarantee of commonality of divine faithfulness, of strategic placement in the battle, of power and of victory. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. The elders and the pastor are supposed to be leading by example as well as by word, teaching not only publicly but privately giving an example so that people can see illustrated in our lives what the scripture is talking about. Making sure that we heed the warning so that we do not fall. Understanding that we have a guarantee of commonality. There hath no temptation you taken you but such as is common to man. All tests are common. There are always going to be the same questions on the test. The Bible tells you what the test is. The Bible tells you what the answer is. When you are going through school, through elementary and middle school and, and high school and then into college and some of you into graduate school, wouldn't you have liked it if at the first day of the semester the teacher passed out the final exam and he passed out the answer key? And he said, this is what the final exam is going to be. Now, we're going to have lectures every day, and I expect you all to be here for the lectures, but this is what's going to be on the exam. It's going to be exactly this. You will have seen this paper before. It is identical to what's going to be on the exam. How many of you would have liked that? Would you have made an A in the class? Or would that first test have flunked you the test of sloth? That was test number one. Remember, he gave it back here. I tell you, I would have loved that. Did you know God has given you what the test is going to be? And he has given you the answer to the test. And he has given it to you in advance. That's what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians. There is the commonality. The same test is given to everybody. The second guarantee is the divine faithfulness. But God is faithful. We serve a God who is there. We serve a God who cares. We serve a God who is real. We serve a God who is going to grade the tests. We serve a God who has also provided the next three things. Number one, strategic placement in the battle. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. He will not put you into a place in the battle where the enemy is too strong for you, where the enemy outnumbers you, where there is no resource for you, where there is no backup for you, where there is no supply line for you. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. The strategic placement in the battle. Number four, the guarantee of power. 
but will above that ye are able above that ye are able that's power ability strength and then victory but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it the apostle paul talks about the trials and testings that he went through by the lying and weight of the jews but he says to the elders at ephesus now you have a responsibility of living it you have the responsibility of giving an example of it you have a responsibility of demonstrating in flesh before the congregation the things that you've learned by setting those old testament saints because they were given to us for examples so that others can see in you what it's talking about even the great prophets face temptation to compromise and I've read this passage before, but let me read it again. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So in other words, Jeremiah got this message over a long period of time. He didn't just have to hang in there for one or two days. He had to hang in there through the reign of several kings. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. All the crummy excuses that we make, like Moses, I can't speak, I'm tied, tongue, tongue, tongue tied. Moses, who made your tongue? Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put words in thy mouth. That was lesson number six. Lesson seven, you must warn the wicked that judgment is coming. Speaking to the elders, we all have to tell others, but especially those who are elders, including the pastor. That's why I've been preaching, as I said, on hell for the last two weeks in the morning worship services. Ken Olson confirmed that out of Ezekiel chapter 3 and 33. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. We will be held accountable for the blood of those who die in their sins if we don't warn them. We don't like to hear that. But that's what Paul says and that's what Ezekiel says. And that's what you find intimated all the way through both Old and New Testament that's why Paul is repeating it in Acts. In other words, the principle applies to the age of grace as well as the age of the law. I hate to think about this. How many people have died in their sins because I failed to warn them? Someday I'll know. It will not be a happy day. We've seen that warning in chapter 3 of Ezekiel, chapter 33. I'll not read it again. Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders. Everything in this passage applies to us as Christians in general, but it is specifically directed to the elders. This passage is designed to bring elders up to speed. Paul warns the elders here what happens when an elder defects from the biblical qualifications. These are men whom Paul himself appointed. They were leading a solid, fundamental, Bible-preaching church that was known for its sound doctrine. One of the most doctrinally mature epistles in the New Testament was written to Ephesus. Before the church is strong, Satan mounts his most vicious attack. We talked last week about the 23 biblical qualifications for elders in Scripture. We intimated the 17 biblical qualifications for deacons. We didn't go through them. But none of the qualifications are optional. To ignore any one or more of the biblical qualifications puts the church in jeopardy. 
We did not read the passage concerning deacons, so I'll read that for you tonight. We went through both Timothy and Titus, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, dealing with elders and with those 23 qualifications about the deacons in 1 Timothy 3, verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be, number one, grave. That's serious, not flippant, not double-tongued. They don't say something and then they do something else. They don't say one thing to one person and a different thing to a different person. Not given to much wine. I can remember back when I was teaching in San Antonio years and years and years ago, at the beginning of my ministry, I wrote Sunday school lessons for all of the grade levels, all the way from children all the way through the adults. Every week I wrote a different lesson and it took a different topic. And one of the series in that series of lessons, 200 different lessons that would be repeated every four years at every grade level as the people matured, was on the deacons. And um, the kids would have to memorize and quote verses. In fact, everybody in the church was memorizing verses every week, including the adults. There was a lot more zeal for the scripture back then. They actually memorized verses. And I can remember one of the little kids, Judy and I were teaching one of the younger children's divisions and the little child quoted here, likewise must the deacons be grave, not double tongued, not given too much wine, <laughs> a double O, not greedy of filthy lucre, because the deacons handle money. And you put the church's finances at jeopardy if you've got a deacon who is greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith number five in a pure conscience. We've talked about the 17 mysteries in the New Testament. The mystery of the faith here is a responsibility of deacons. We'll see why in a moment. They've got to understand it. They've got to be able to apply it. They've got to be able to proclaim it. The faith, definite article. With a pure conscience, they can't be hypocrites about doing it. Let these also first be proved. You don't appoint them to office until they have proven themselves. And then let them use the office of a deacon. In other words, they're supposed to be doing something, not merely holding title. They are to use the office of a deacon. Number eight, being found blameless. Same as the elders. Verse 11. They've got to be married to a specific kind of a woman. She has at least four character qualities outlined for us here in 1 Timothy 3. Even so must their wives be a grave. In other words, if a man has a wife who is an airhead or who is giddy or who is foolish, he's not qualified to be a deacon. B, not slanderers. Oh my. Do you know any women who have tongues that are sharp as swords? C, sober, serious-minded. D, faithful in all things. They can always be trusted. They can always be counted upon. You know, there's some great men who are married to some awful women. Their wives can disqualify them from being in church office. Number nine, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. Number 10, ruling their children and number 11, their own house as well. Why? The reason is given in verse 13. You see, elders are chosen from the deacons. The deacons first have to meet certain qualifications and prove themselves before being appointed to office. Then when they're in office, they have to use the office of a deacon. They don't merely hold title. They do something. 
Since the elders are chosen from the deacons, they must manifest the required qualities for an elder in advance. Because it says here, for they that have used the office of a deacon well, they don't merely sort of semi-function in the office. They that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree. They are earning something. They are buying it. The word a good degree there is the word for a step on an ascending staircase. They begin to move up. And, and here we see the proper use reveals leadership gifts such as evangelist. Stephen was one of the first deacons in Acts 6. And great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. There's a practical reason for everything that's in Scripture. This is not merely head theology. This is not merely how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. This is essential because the church is under attack. This is essential because there will be wolves from the outside. This is essential because there are those from among your own selves, it says Paul to the Ephesian elders, who will rise up seeking to bring disciples after themselves. There will be divisions in the church. That's hierasis. That's the word translated heresies. Farewell to Ephesus. The Apostle Paul reminds them of the things that would happen. The other passage giving us qualifications for deacons is back in Acts 6. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. None to have called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Seven may seem like a lot, but remember, there are several thousand people in the church at this point. There are many widows in the church at this point, both among Jews and Greeks, Greek-speaking Jews. The twelve called the multitude of disciples and said, Our responsibility is the word of God and prayer. That's the responsibility of elders and pastors. Not all the temporal things of the church. We have trustees who are supposed to be doing those things. We should have deacons who are actually taking care of them in a spiritual manner. We have provision in our bylaws for deacons. Are you praying for qualified deacons? I hope you do. I hope you pray that every day. I pray that every day. Because it's from that pool that elders should be appointed. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, qualification for a deacon. And Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And when the church is functioning properly, do you know what the result is? It tells you in verse 7. And the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient. Not merely believed, but were obedient to the faith. God's ways are the ways of success. God's ways are the ways of blessing. God's ways are the ways that he has set for us to follow that we might have his blessing. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. 
We pray that you will take your word as it has gone forth tonight, that you will challenge our hearts, that you will make us obedient. We pray especially for the leadership of this church, for this pastor, for these elders, that you will also send us deacons, qualified according to your word. Father, we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will be honored and magnified, glorified, exalted, and receive all the praise here in this place. We pray that you will help us to remember the 12 different tests that each one of us has to face and where we must not compromise if we would have victory. The tests that come on every one of us, even as they came on the children of Israel, and how often we are ignorant of who they were and what they did and why they did it and the results, the consequences of what happened when they did those things because we're slothful, we're proud, and we have all the lusts of the flesh, and we live in a culture whereby we can indulge those things quite easily. Father, we confess our sins. We come to you for cleansing because of your grace. The law only condemns us. But Father, we thank you that it does because it reminds us that we cannot make our way back to you without the grace of Christ. And so we run to the foot of the cross and we hold tight to the feet of Jesus as did Mary Magdalene. For he is our Savior. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.